Do you like making decisions? Because I don't. I don't like it at all. Very difficult, isn't it, sometimes? Things happen in life and you've got to make a decision about how you're going to react and how you've got to respond. Something happens and what are you going to do? So it could be an, a problem arising at work. It could be some opportunity that comes up for a new job. Maybe it's someone in the ecclesia who's going down a wrong path. Or maybe the whole ecclesia is going down the wrong path in your opinion. Maybe someone hurts you very badly or they might hurt someone that you love. Or you might hurt someone. Maybe someone asks you for a very big favour and you don't know how to respond. Or maybe you're beginning to spend a lot more time on a, on a um, hobby or an interest in life. Or maybe you're in a relationship that is not doing you any good. And suddenly life becomes uh, very complex, doesn't it? It goes from being extremely simple in childhood. When we're kids, we've got very limited uh, decision-making ability um, or authority, very limited choices anyway, and most of the decisions in life are made for us, even though we don't like it at the time. And then suddenly you get older and it, it all gets very complicated and the decisions are yours to make. Now, when we come to a book like Proverbs, there's, there's, there's two different ways we could look at it. If you look at it one way, you pick up a book like Proverbs and you read it and you think, well, that's a very challenging book. Because if you think of lifestyle decisions, they are easier if we, ju if we just do what comes naturally to us. Okay? You, the results may not be the best for us, we may not make the best decisions, but the decisions themselves are very easy because we just think, well, what, what's going to make me feel better? What feels right to me? That's what I'll do. What would I like to do? That's what I'll do. Now, that's, a, that's an easy decision, irrespective of whatever results come from it. The challenge comes when we, we decide to try and be different to what comes naturally to us. Then that becomes a bit of a challenge. And here we've got a book with these hundreds of proverbs that challenge us to do something that doesn't come naturally to us. Right? It's a book that challenges us to be like God when we're not naturally like God. Now, doing something that's not natural to you is harder than doing something that comes naturally to you. So suddenly the book becomes quite a challenging book. Now, if we view Proverbs from that perspective, it can seem quite a daunting book. I think, like, well, I couldn't possibly live up to all of these things. How could, I, how could I live like this? Viewed from that perspective, it makes decision-making seem like it's harder and more challenging. But we can look at Proverbs from a totally different perspective. And that is, we could say, what this book does is it makes my decision-making extremely easy. Very, very simple. This book can put an end to laying in bed at night and tossing and turning about whether you've made the right decision or what decision you think you should make. It can put an end to agonising over weighing up the possible consequences of doing this or doing that. It can put an end to stressing over what others might have done in this situation, what your friends or your family members are saying you should really do in this situation. It can put an end to worrying about how other people might react if I do a certain thing. What it does is it just cuts through all of that with a very, very simple message. And an example of that simple message is in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. And Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 tells us, to trust in Yahweh with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. The word trust means to be confident, sure, bold or secure. It's a great feeling, isn't it? It's a great feeling when you know you've made the right decision and you don't have to second guess or worry about it anymore. And the book of Proverbs can give us that great feeling. Because what that verse is telling us, isn't it, that if, you, if I lean on my own understanding, I'm leaning on something that is at best fairly unstable 
and it might even fall over and I might even get hurt. I'm putting my weight on something that is not reliable. But it says, forget about that, and simply trust in Yahweh. And the thing about that is that when we read the Proverbs in this book, what we're doing is we're not putting our trust in the Proverbs as such. What we're doing is we're putting our trust in the source of those Proverbs. If you come back to chapter 2 and verse 6, it tells us that Yahweh giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. There's our three words all packaged up together. And where do they come from? They come from God. That's the one we're putting trust in. We're putting trust in the source of those Proverbs. It is as if we've gone to God himself. And we sort of respectfully imagine this. That if we could go to God himself and say, My dear Heavenly Father, what would you do in this situation? And God answers and says, I would do this. Now, if we could actually do that, if we, we could actually um, approach God in that way and get an answer like that from God, are you going to then go to bed that night and lay in bed at night and toss and turn and think, did I make the right decision or not? Maybe I should have done this or that. Am I really being fair to myself? Am I being too lenient or am I being too hard or whatever and you toss and turn and worry about that? Are you, going to, are you going to spend one minute worrying about that when you've been able to go to God and he said, well, this is what I'd do. We would, you go to bed that night and we sleep very, very peacefully indeed. And that's what we're told in chapter 3 and verse 24. It says, When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down and thy sleep shall be sweet. You couldn't get a, sleep, a, 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 um, a sweeter sleep than that, could you? Then God has said, this is what you should do. And we did it. And now we don't have to worry anymore. It doesn't matter whether what we did seems unfair. It doesn't matter whether we feel as though we're just getting ripped off or we, 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 we're being taken advantage of by someone. Maybe we should be a little bit harder. Maybe I should stand my ground. I have done what God has told me to and I can go to bed at night and not worry about it anymore. And the great thing, of course, about this book is that you read a verse like chapter 3, verse 5, and it says, Trust in Yahweh with all thine heart. And that you could read that and think, well, that's a, that's a, that's a nice sentiment. It's pretty vague, though. It doesn't really... What, what does it actually mean? It's a fairly impractical thing. Trust in Yahweh. What does that actually mean? Because then, of course... What follows in the following pages are hundreds of very, very specific examples of what that would mean in daily life. So it takes what is a fairly, um, you know, sort of high concept of, but a vague concept in a sense of trust in Yahweh, and it makes it very, very practical. And when we view Proverbs that way, it doesn't, it ceases to become a very daunting and a challenging book, and it becomes a book that can just simplify our life. It doesn't mean that, that what we're going to do is easy to do. It just means that the process of deciding and weighing up our options becomes very, very easy because we have absolute confidence that we have made the right decision because we didn't make the decision. See, that's the problem, isn't it? If I lean on my, my own understanding, was that something I should lean on or not? How stable was that? Is it going to fall over tomorrow? Or in, in 10 years, am I going to realise I made the wrong decision? No, we've lent on something very, very stable and that is, of course, the wisdom of God. He's the one who's made our decisions for us. And even if in the short term things don't seem to go that well and we look back and think, gee, things have gone badly since I made that decision, we don't have to worry because we've done what God told us to do. We've done what God himself would have done in that situation. Now, I'm sure that in your life, you've had um, examples of that where, where you've actually done that. And I've had examples like that in my life as well. Too few, many times, much more often not doing that. But I know in my life that when I've, on occasions when I've done that, and it, and it really goes against what you would, you would normally think would be fair or, you know, I'm, I'm being, not being fair to myself or I should do this or I should stand my ground on this. 
on those occasions where you, you actually make a decision that you wouldn't normally have made, I'm sure you've experienced that, that the moment you make that decision, it is the, just the greatest burden just comes off your shoulders and it just seems so obvious what you should do and you think, why didn't I think of that earlier? Why didn't I just realise that simple point, what would God have me do? And you make the decision and then just there's no more worry at all. There's n you never have to worry about it because we never forget that moment where we made that decision and we knew it was right and whatever circumstances come, it doesn't matter. Whatever anyone else says to us doesn't matter because we've followed what God told us to do. We've lent on something that is stable. So that's what I think is the, is the blessing of godly wisdom from this book. What about the subject of truth? We, we often use the phrase the truth, don't we? we you know, I, I'm in the truth. Is she in the truth? He left the truth. We're all living our lives in the truth. And of course what we're saying is that we, we understand the true message of the Bible by God's blessing and, and what he says is true and we understand it so we say that we're in the truth. And we use that phrase in that way. But if, that's, if that is true, then the very least we could be is truthful people. Honest and truthful people. There are lots of ways to reflect God in our life. But a first base, surely, in our lives is to be honest and truthful people. How much do you value honesty and truth in your life? How important is that to you or to me? Because as we've seen, God, as we know, Proverbs is about, is about godly wisdom. It's about godly wisdom. So even if you know, concepts like truth and honesty... Most people in the world, vast majority of people in the world, would, would agree with that. Very few people would say, no, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a serial liar and I'm, <laughs> I think that's the right way to be. Just about everyone would say, yeah, honesty and truth is important. But, and they, but they would say that regardless of whether they believe in God. They're, they're probably honest people. We want to experience the quality of honesty and truth in our life because they're what God does. They are what God is. God is actually represented by that concept of honesty and truth. There's a verse we all know so well from Deuteronomy. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Now he's a rock. You look at that rock. You know that rock's not going anywhere. If you took that photo on a holiday of that rock and then you went back 10 years later and you found that it was 50 metres to the left of where it was in exactly the same you know, configuration, but it's moved, you'd be absolutely amazed. You, you'd just, would that be an unbelievable thing? Well, we just know that wouldn't happen. You know that rock is going to be exactly the same spot as it was when you first saw it. That is an unchanging, reliable fact. And God uses that concept to describe what he's like in relation to truth. Everything he says is true. And he knew that one day there would be a generation of his children that would live in an era which, where, where morality is just very, very flexible, truth is very blurry and some people believe some things, some people, and, and most people don't even care that other people believe other things. Everyone's got their own um, version of truth. So we live in an area of fake news, and we've got, we're, we're living with a thing called the internet that just absolutely feeds in and creates that situation. And God knew that one day a group of his children would, would live in a world and would have to struggle with that, and wear that group. So we're going to look at a verse like that and say, well, that represents absolute stability, truth and honesty. So we ought to be a people that are, are obsessed with the truth, obsessed with the truth. Now, I'd like you to just come with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Have a look at what the Apostle Paul said <clears throat> to the Ephesians about this, this concept of truth. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, 
He said, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour. For we are members one of another. Now, why do you think he's, he's linked telling the truth with the fact that, they're one, that we are one body? Because he, he, he could have ended that verse in any way. He could have just ended it saying, tell the truth. But he says, tell the truth. Why? Well, because you are members of the same body. So if you think of the human body, the human body operates as a unit, doesn't it? The human body cooperates with itself. The various parts help the other parts to do things they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. So my brain tells my arm to move my hand to that bottle and pick up the bottle. And then it tells my mouth what to do when the, <laughs> when the bottle goes down my mouth or the water goes down my mouth. The whole thing cooperates together. So the various messages that are being sent are predictable and they are reliable and they're helpful. So the body, in a sense, is true to itself. And above all, no part of the body goes out of its way to unnecessarily hurt another part of the body. So it's very rare that my brain would tell my hand you know, to pick up a hammer and bang myself over the head. In fact, I can't think that that's ever happened, and I, I trust it never will, because that would be counterproductive to my body. The, the body cooperates with itself. Why does it do that? Well, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, in verse 15, Paul says, by, But speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth in love, we grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So we're all connected to, to Christ, who is our head, and a body part only acts as it's instructed by the head. So the ideal situation is this, that when I speak to, when I speak to you and say something to you, it's like when two parts of a body can rely on each other and they're helping each other. You can be absolutely sure that what I'm telling you is the truth. And when I'm speaking to someone else about you, we can be absolutely sure that I'm only saying what is true and I'm only saying anything at all because I think it's going to help and benefit another part of the body, which in this case is you. And that's all happens because we're all connected to this head, Christ, which directs us to do those various things. Now that's the ideal, isn't it? It's ideal if it works that way. But very often we all fall well short of that ideal. Now, when we think of the subject of truth, when we're considering um, the concept of truth, if we just think, if we just think that the opposite of truth is is deliberate lying, then we miss the point probably entirely, because as I said, very few people, and hopefully none of us actually go out of our way to tell blatant deliberate lies. But if that's all we think when we read a proverb that, for example, tells us about being honest. If we think, well, okay, am I honest? Yeah, I don't tell, I don't go out of my way to tell deliberate, blatant lies. Well, that's good. That's a, that's one of the six hundred that I'm doing. I can move on to the next one. If we think like that, we're missing the point of the proverb, because we might not be truthful, honest people. I'll show you this picture of this man. This, this is a man called, not a happy man, by, uh, admittedly, but anyway, he was a man called Samuel Johnson, and he he. Um, was an English writer and he wrote various religious writings. He died in 1784. So his name is Samuel Johnson and another fellow called Boswell wrote a book about him and the book was called The Life of Johnson. And this is what he said. This is one little comment in this book. So he's describing a, a, a little circumstance that, that um, Samuel Johnson was in. So he says, Next morning... At breakfast, Johnson gave a very earnest recommendation of what he himself practised, a strict attention to truth, even in the most minute particulars. Accustom your children, said he, said Johnson, accustom your children constantly to this. If a thing happened at one window, and they, when relating it, say it happened at another, do not let it pass but instantly check them. You do not know where deviation from truth will end. 
Our lively hostess replied, Nay, this is too much. Little variations in narrative must happen a thousand times a day if one is not perpetually watching. Johnson replied, Well, madam, you ought to be perpetually watching. It is more from carelessness about truth than from intentional lying that there is so much falsehood in the world. Now, that's a very important point that he's making there, isn't it? Must have been a very honest man. It's very easy to underestimate the importance of accuracy because we don't know where things can lead. And we can be fairly flippant sometimes with accuracy in what we're saying. Another thing that this Samuel Johnson said, this is later on in life, he's, no, he's certainly no happier if we look at him there. And I think the other thing, it's only an aside, but I was thinking like there he is in his 30s, losing his, starting to lose his hair, obviously. And even though he's an absolute stickler for honesty, later on in life, he was very dishonest when it came to his hair. Because that's not true. That is not true, that hair. Anyway, um, there he is later in life, and he made this comment. He said, great caution, here's the comment, there it is, great caution is necessary to avoid adjusting stories. Some tell what they do not know, so they won't seem ignorant, and others from mere indifference about truth. All truth is not indeed of equal importance, but if little violations are allowed, every violation will in time be thought little. That's so true, isn't it? We, we, then not everything's of equal importance, but we don't know where things can lead. And a very good rule in life is to say, nothing is going to leave my lips unless I know for sure that it is true. And this sort of thing gets... We, 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 we sort of break that rule so many times in life. So many people do. You know, you, you walk along... You might be walking along in the street and you see a couple of um, ladies walk past, or men, doesn't have to be ladies, but it could be ladies, and you, you, know, you, hear, you just hear a snippet of conversation. And you hear one of them say, oh, I'm pretty sure he knew how she felt, so I don't know, I think it was pretty terrible why, that he said that. And that's all you hear. And you go on and you think, I wonder what that was about. I'm pretty sure he knew how she felt, so that was terrible that he said what he did. And you think, who is this guy? Maybe he didn't know how that woman felt. There's this, some guy sitting across in you know, a couple of suburbs working away in a bank or something, and he's having his character crucified by these two women on the basis that she's pretty sure that he knew how she felt. And if he did know how she felt, well, maybe he shouldn't have said what he did. But she's just pretty sure that he knew, but what if he, did, what if he didn't know? Well, that puts an entirely different complexion on, doesn't it? But she doesn't know that. And so the conversation goes on. And of course, the conversation that goes on is far more interesting if it's just allowed to go on. If the other woman says, well, you don't know that he felt that way. Oh, okay, so suddenly the conversation becomes very boring. What are we going to talk about now? But if we say, well, yeah, maybe he did feel that way, well, then we've got an interesting conversation to be had. And so it goes on. The whole thing is based on the whole conversation was based on speculation. And God hates that sort of thing. And we do that so much in life. I remember a few years ago, I was with um, my brother Jack at a toy fair overseas, and there's this guy called Jerry Crown. And Jerry Crown, you might have seen board games with a brand called Crown and Andrews. It's a pretty famous brand. Anyway, he's, he's Jerry Crown. And he's always at the toy fairs every year, and he's with this woman called Audrey. And Audrey, I don't think she's his wife, but he's, she's his business partner. Anyway, they always see them together at the toy fairs every year. And I remember one year we went, a few years ago, and we were with this other guy, and we walked into a room, and we saw Audrey. And we said, oh, there's Audrey. And we said, oh, where's, I wonder where Jerry is. And the guy we were with said, he's actually died. And we said... That's incredible. When did that happen? Oh, I'm not sure when, but yeah, he's passed away. Oh, that's, that's very sad. He's a, a really, you know, 
bit of an icon in the industry. That's very sad. Anyway, then next minute, in walks Jerry. <laughs> and uh, he was well and truly alive, and uh, we were thrilled to see Jerry, and so that was, it was a happy end to the story. But you sort of think to yourself, how did that actually happen? Like, he's someone, he's, he's, been, he's, he's obviously got sick, and then someone has said, Jerry's sick. And then that person who's heard it has said to someone else, Jerry's sick. And they've said to someone else, Jerry's sick. And that person's gone to the next person and said, Jerry's dead. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very, very, um, you know, there's not like a gradual thing. That's a very, very sudden transition. And that's what must have happened for that to have occurred. That has actually happened. Someone's heard he's sick and said he's dead. And it, the thing is, it always, it always goes in that direction, doesn't it? It's not like... Someone hears that um, Jerry's uh, unwell. Or Jerry, no, it's not like Jerry dies, and then someone hears that Jerry's dead, and they say to someone, Jerry's dead, and they say to the next person, Jerry's unwell. That never, ha never goes that way. And then the next person says, Jerry's well. <laughs> well, how come we're at his funeral? <laughs> he's, not, he's not that well. So it's just funny the way it always sort of goes in the, in the direction of what makes it more interesting. It's far more interesting if Jerry's dead than if he's just simply unwell. This just happens all the time. I was ha having a meal with um, Cliff Simmons. A lot of you, you would know Cliff back in Melbourne a few weeks ago, and we were sitting in... Um, it's a place called Knox City. Some of you would know that. And there's a lot of restaurants. So there's hundreds of people, because everyone's madly going out to, to eat out, because we're just... It's like a window of time when we can do that before the next lockdown. So we're all out there in these restaurants. And I was sitting there with Cliff, and I said... I said, look at all these people, all this conversation going on. I said, what percentage of the millions of words that is being spoken do you reckon would actually be true? And, and I had a figure in my head. Now, you just think of a figure in your head. What do you think would be, what percentage of, of what's being said is actually the absolute honest truth? You get a figure in your head. What do you think, Max? What are you thinking? 10%. Max has got a very black and dark view. <laughs> Goodness me. Max is having a bad day. What about, um, what about you, Rodney? What did you think? I think about 40%. 40%? Yeah, so, well, Cliff said 50%. I said 60%. Anyone have more than 70, 80? 70, very optimistic, very bright, sunny, optimistic view. Wrong. It's wrong. What you're saying is wrong. It's another lie. <laughs> so it's, so we're, we're just operating on, on, on lies. We're, just, we're, we're reacting to people. We're learning about what people are doing. We're forming opinions about what other people are doing based on there's a 50, at best 50-50 like chance or something like that that it's all actually either false or true. It's amazing that we can actually you know, conduct life in that way. Now, we come to a book like Proverbs, and it tells us that God is truth. And, and God is a God of truth because he, he hates what's false. Now, you come with me to Proverbs chapter 6. These are very familiar words to us. In Proverbs chapter 6. So in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, we read, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong page, Proverbs 6 verse 16, These six things doth Yahweh hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among Brethren. Verse 16 says, These are things that God hates. The word in the Hebrew for abomination, abomination in verse 16, is a word which or it means disgusting, abhorrent, or detestable. Now, if I asked you, what, what sins do you find disgusting, abhorrent and detestable what really really annoys you and, and just makes you feel sick to think that that's going on would it be little untruths that occur amongst us Some, I think for probably many of us there'd be different type of sins that would fall into that category but 
This is a list of what God finds absolutely disgusting. And in that list, two of the seven relate to this practice of inaccurate and dishonest talk. Verse 17 says he hates a, a, a lying tongue. The Hebrew word means a sham. Something, we said something is true, but it's false. So the whole thing's a sham. In verse 19, he hates a false witness that speaks lies. A witness means a, to testify or to record. So if we put verse 17 and 19 together, it seems to be referring both to, to sort of inaccurate talk in, in verse 17 and deliberate lying in verse 19. Deliberate deceit, like a witness giving false testimony about something. And now both of those things are disgusting to God. He hates them. And we need to take this sort of thing very, very seriously. Because we view certain type of sins as particularly abhorrent or damaging, and rightly so. And certain things happen in ecclesial life and the, the whole place is scandalised by it. And it's terrible. And we never forget it. And we remember it for many, many years to come. But we often give a very casual pass to the sort of dishonesty and inaccuracy that God absolutely hates. And of course, it doesn't even have to be uh, spoken. It could be something that we just think. It goes unspoken, but it's still false. So I might think to myself, um, I wonder why I don't, see, I don't see James talking to Mason very often. I wonder why that is. I think maybe he's... Um, Maybe he sort of feels a bit intimidated by him. I mean, Mason's a pretty good-looking guy, and he's 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 active and you know, fairly talented. James, not so much, <laughs> on all counts. But yeah, I think he might be a little bit um, he might be a little bit jealous of him. Actually, I reckon that's why they're not speaking to him, why they're not talking, why he's not talking to him. And that whole thing is not even true. <laughs> it's all. I, I, I think perhaps Mason is uh, perhaps James is jealous of Mason. Uh, may he might feel a little bit intimidated by him. I think that Mason is a little bit more talented than James, and that's why he feels that way. And maybe that's why he's not talking to him. So the whole thing is perhaps maybe I think this way. That could be the case. And I've reached a conclusion that is I've gone way off what's true in my own mind, based on a whole lot of little. Um, moments in my mind, like the way my mind has gone, it's gone that way, that way, that way and that way and I'm over here and the truth is right over here and I've just made a series of wrong decisions based on my own speculation, based on nothing and the whole result is dishonest and it's even if it's unspoken God hates that sort of thing but when it's then spoken that's when it really kicks in because look verse 19 says a, a false witness that speaks lies the word in the Hebrew means to puff or fan or kindle. So I've got this false idea in my mind, totally wrong, about the relationship between James and Mace. And, I, and not only is it in my mind now, I've, I've blown on it and blown it and fanned it. And now it's away it goes. Now other people think the same thing. And now they're adding to it. It's becoming more and more interesting as, it, as this proceeds through the group. And God just hates that sort of thing. He just finds that absolutely disgusting. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, that in our legal system, they say, you know, when someone gets up in court and they say, I've got to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that's, when you think about it, that's very well crafted, that, that statement. Because I could tell the truth, but leave out things. And I could tell the truth, but be mixed with some lies. And I can still say I'm telling the truth. But if I say I'm telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, that leaves me no room for any deviation at all from completely what is true. And that's what we've got to be like. Just come with me to Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 1. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 1 says, A false balance is abomination to Yahweh, but a just weight is his delight. So there's our word abomination again. It's the same word. It's disgusting. And it says, a f what, what, what God finds disgusting is a false balance. In the Hebrew, it means craft, deception, or guile. So this is quite a deliberate dishonesty, isn't it? 
But not only is God disgusted by that, we, we could sort of expect that, but what that verse tells us is that the opposite of that delights him. It actually delights him. And it's not as if, so you think, well, gee, that's, that's good. What, what actually delights God? What could I do to delight, delight God? It's not something particularly um, onerous that delights God that we've got to do. It's not something particularly elaborate. It is simply telling the truth. God's not asking us to take those scales and adjust them in favour of, of my customer. If, I, if they were my scales and I'm a businessman, he's not asking me to adjust them in favour of my customer. He's just simply asking me to tell the truth. Do what's fair for him and fair for me and be honest about it. And that, that proverb tells us that actually puts a smile on God's face. That actually delights God. So when we stick rigidly to the truth in what we think of people and what we say about people and how we treat people, we are causing God to feel the emotion of joy. The God of heaven and the earth feels the emotion of joy when we do something simple like that. What, an, what a simple thing to do. What a simple rule to adopt in our life to give joy to God. We, do, we love to think that we could give joy to God. We think, what great thing could I do to make God happy? What a mountain to climb. But what, I haven't got the talent to do it. I haven't got the time to do it. All these things we say. And that proverb tells us, you just be honest. Just tell the truth all the time and that will make God very, very happy. It, it could perhaps be the single greatest rule that we could adopt in our life. And one final point on truth before we move on from that. When you look at Proverbs 11 verse 1 and you think, well, why is a just weight such a delight to God? Why does that give him so much joy? You'd think, you know, doesn't he need more than that to make him happy? Well, if you come over to Proverbs 16 verse 11, we have the answer to that question. This is why it's so important to God. Proverbs 16 verse 11 says, A just weight and balance are Yahweh's. All the weights of the bag are his work. So they are God's weights and balances. So the issue of truth and honesty and accuracy isn't just a, an issue of fair trading amongst people. It is far, far bigger than that because God actually is truth. Not only is he truthful, it's not something he does, he actually is truth. And when we say and think true things, we are, in effect, endorsing and we're applauding what God is. And that's like a little bit of God on the earth in our lives. Amazing to think that, isn't it? Proverbs 12 verse 17 says, He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness. We'd love to think we could show forth some sort of righteousness in our life. Well, that's a very, very simple way to do it. And it works. It actually does make God happy. But that's why it's such an offence to God when we take the truth that he has created and we change it, whether it's deliberate or careless or flippant or whatever it is. What we are doing is changing God because God is truth. He's, those weights and scales are his. They are him. We are taking God and we are distorting God as a being when we don't tell the truth. And that's what it means, isn't it, to put God into the Proverbs. Because an atheist could read these verses and say, well, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm an honest person. I don't tell deliberate lies. And that may well be true. Good on him if he does. But he's not doing that to endorse or reflect God. We want to be truthful because God is truth. And that anything less than the truth is a denial of the very existence of God. Now, before we finish... Let's just, in, uh, in a few minutes, cover nine chapters of Proverbs, and we will just do this extremely quickly, because that'll set us up from tomorrow and the rest of the weekend as we, as we look at some um, themes from the, from the second part of the book. So Proverbs chapters 1 to 9, what are they all about? Well, that, in summary, is what they're about. They're about wisdom, as we said earlier. They describe what wisdom is, where it comes from, it comes from God how we can get it and keep it, and what it can do in our life. And 
as uh, I think I said earlier as well, that the importance of that section is that that puts God into the second part of the book. Because the second part of the book is all about that wisdom in daily life and it's wisdom from God. So it's, we've got to have God, always God, in every single proverb and that's because the basis is a, a quality, a concept that comes from God and it's who he is. Now what is the structure of Proverbs 1 to 9? When I put up this next slide, don't let your eyes glaze over and just think, oh, no, really? <laughs> do we have to do this? Because I'm not even going to go through all of the details at all. But that is the structure of chapter 9. So just without, don't bother really reading those words unless you want to, unless you're very quick. But So we've got a prologue, which we've looked at, and we've got an epilogue at the end. So that's those two bookends there. And we've got a series of 10 lectures. And they're like lectures that a father gives to his son on various different subjects. They're a series of lectures that he gives. And then there's t these two interludes in blue where wisdom is personified. It's, it, they're very poetic, where wisdom is described as a person saying things and calling to us and telling what, what, what it actually is, what it's all about. And then we've got that little appendix in the middle. So that really is the, just the, the, the structure of it. But one of the interesting things you find, and you might have found this as you, as you read through the first nine chapters of Proverbs, is the fact that there's this emphasis on, on women, about two particular women in, in that section. So, that's not come up all that well, but these, these lines here that are highlighted a little bit, they are parts of those nine chapters where um, they're, all about, they're, they're all about women and they, give, they create this um, imaginary woman and describe that as having, her as having certain qualities. In fact, if you look at the first nine chapters of Proverbs, over 50% of them are about these women. So we've got wisdom described as a woman and we've got wisdom versus a different type of woman a, a, a very different type of woman a wrong type of woman now why would it be why would that structure be there because it's very noticeable when you when you read through that it is there and i think that the, the answer to that is that in that's in the section what you find is the repeated phrase my son so these nine chapters are sort of set in the in the image of that, of a, of, a, of a father, in this case a king, giving advice to his son. Of those ten lectures, eight of them start with my son. So that's the context in which Proverbs is sort of couched. But it's, it's a royal court and the king has the responsibility of giving advice to his son as it prepares for one day his son will be the king. Now it could be in a house, couldn't it? A father gives advice to his son because one day he's going to be the, the leader of that house on a, on a smaller scale. That's the context in which these first nine chapters are written. Now that clearly doesn't mean that Proverbs is irrelevant to women because um, on a couple of occasions in, or in chapter 1 in chapter 8 it, talks, it says forsake not the law of thy mother. So she must have also acquired wisdom as well. So it's not just you know, a, a book by men for men and women need not uh, show any interest. It's not that at all. And yet we do have that quite stunning proportion where over half of it is about these women. And I think that the reason for that is if you think of that king advising his son, what's he saying to his son? He's, he wants his son to grow up well and to develop into a godly man. And that king knows when he looks at his son, that one of the greatest problems that son's going to face, one of the greatest kinds of challenges he's going to face is the attraction of sin of any kind. And of all the different kinds of sin that are going to beset him, one of the biggest areas of potential disaster in his life is going to be his attraction to women. Now, there's nothing wrong with that attraction, obviously, which was created by God. But if it's handled badly, people can destroy their lives over it, and they do. People lose everything. They lose their careers. They lose their families. They finish up in jail sometimes because of that problem. And ironically, Solomon fell foul of that problem himself, and so did David, of course, as we know. So in describing the value of wisdom and what it can do for us, 
what better way than to pit wisdom against one of the greatest minefields in life? And that's what I think it's doing. It's, it's taking a great quality and a powerful quality and it's pitting it against a formidable foe that this young man is going to face. And very cleverly and very poetically, wisdom itself is described as a woman. So the Proverbs take a strong woman with the power to destroy that son's life if he lets it. And the father says that there's an even stronger woman who can defeat that other woman and protect you against her. And that's the woman that I call wisdom. So Proverbs is, is obviously not just a book for, for men and nor is it a book about the attraction between men and women. It, it was simply couched in that way as the advice of a king to his son. And that son represents every one of us here, men and women, and the advice that he gives represents every type of problem we can face in life. And we've all got different problems, and for many, you know, most of us, we've got certain problems in our life that just seem so monumental and so insurmountable, and we've battled them for decades and decades, and nothing changes. And we think, am I, is it, am I ever going to beat this problem? Or am I just going to go through to the judgment or my death? And let's just hope for the best at the judgment because I never ever, got, never ever beat it. We've all got those things in our life. And that's what this book addresses. Now, just on the structure as we finish, you can see down the bottom there, there's an epilogue, which was, which was um, uh, read, read earlier by Matt. This epilogue, in chapter 9. And what it is, is a very dramatic picture of two invitations from two different types of women. We've got our two different women and they both put their proposals to us. They're two different women and two very different functions that we are invited to attend. The second one in that chapter would look something like that. You can hardly see it up there, and that's, that's probably very appropriate. It's a very, very seedy, rough, shoddily prepared event, which appears from the, from the outside to be very attractive and a bit of fun, a lot of fun, fun people there. But the Proverbs tells us in the end of chapter 9, it's a room full of rotting corpses. And then we read of a second invitation in verse 1 and 2. Wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn her seven pillars, she hath killed her beasts, she has mingled her wine, she has furnished her table. A very, very different event is presented to which we are invited. It's a very carefully prepared event, a beautifully set out banquet. And that banquet is what we read in Proverbs 10 to 31. That's the last thing we read before we launch into the banquet itself. We are invited to attend a banquet. And when we get to the banquet, we find that we have just got page after page after page of beautifully prepared courses, full of variety and full of interest. And it would take a lifetime for us to partake of that beautiful banquet. But it's going to be our privilege over the rest of the weekend to sample some of the delights, just a few, of the delights of what this wonderful woman called Wisdom has laid out for us on her magnificent table. Mm -hmm.